from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Thank you for listening. If you're not already a subscriber, please sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen, and please leave us a nice review. This week, are we in the midst of a new financial crisis? The failure of Silicon Valley Bank last weekend and the federal bailout of its depositors this week suddenly focused attention on the stresses and weaknesses in the U.S. financial system. Two other American banks, these with heavy exposure to the cryptocurrency markets, also went under, and there have been fears all week about the health of other, smaller U.S. financial institutions. With Credit Suisse, one of Europe's most storied names in banking, also stumbling into the arms of its central bank, which threw the lender an emergency $50 billion lifeline, the crisis seems to be going global. So how bad is it? What's behind these latest tremors? Specifically, why did SVP's depositors get a bailout? Even those many customers there with deposits well in excess of federal deposit insurance guarantee limits. And SVP wasn't even supposed to be a systemically important bank that was too big to fail. Did the Biden administration do its many friends in Silicon Valley a favor? Well, to talk about all this, I'm delighted to be joined this week by Sheila Baer. Ms. Baer was chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation during the tumultuous years of the global financial crisis 15 years ago. She headed the agency from 2006 to 2011 and was involved in most of the crucial decisions made back then as the Bush and then Obama administrations, along with the Federal Reserve and other agencies, grappled with the crisis. She was often known for clashing with colleagues at the Fed and the Treasury at the time, especially for taking a harder line than some others on bank bailouts. She often urged greater accountability for the banks that were receiving government support. Before joining the FDIC, Ms. Baer held a range of posts in government and academia. She's now president of Washington College in Maryland, becoming the first woman appointed to that position in the school's 234-year history. And Sheila Baer joins me now. Sheila Baer, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Happy to be here. SVB was a small bank, is a small bank by kind of any measure in comparison with the major U.S. financial institutions. It's not designated a systemically important financial institution. More than 90% of deposits were deposits over the FDIC guaranteed limits. So those depositors presumably knew any risks they were taking, putting more than that FDIC limited amount in there. Why should those depositors have got a bailout? Good question. Based on what I know, I don't think they should have. I was uh, pretty astonished. Just as you observed, this is a $200 billion institution and a $23 trillion banking system. The uninsured depositors were very well healed. You know, it was the who's who of venture capitalists and the portfolio companies that they funded. An argument was made that there were some small startups that needed their uninsured deposits for payroll. I don't know who those were. I think it was probably a pretty small number. It'd be nice if somebody disclosed that list. But even if that was the case, the end of the FDIC's usual practice, uh, they would have declared probably at least a 50% dividend to the uninsured next week, or excuse me, the week following the failure. So that would have given the uninsured some some access to cash. So the usual processes, I think, should have been used. They were perfectly adequate to deal with this bank failure. And I'm astonished that they made a systemic risk determination. I don't see anything systemic about it, unless they know something I don't know. (laughs) But based on the public information, I'm not buying it. And I'm sure you certainly know more than I and most of us. But the argument, I guess, that was made was there are a large number of these medium-sized, smaller banks. Some of them we know have been in the news. They seem to have some problems themselves. That if you just allow the depositors in something like SVP to take a big haircut, to lose much of what they have over 250000 then everybody who's got more than $250,000 in every single U.S. bank account, which is not one of the big, big money center banks, is going to immediately do a bank run, shift those deposits out, put them into J.P. Morgan or Wells Fargo or whatever in a flight to safety. And that was the concern. Was that a legitimate concern in your view? Well, again, I think it might be a self-fulfilling prophecy by saying that this individual bank was systemic. It implies there's something more broadly wrong with the banking system. I think the communication around this have been, which I think would be accurate and true, that this was a very poorly managed bank. There were some supervisory lapses that were unusual and should not have occurred. And uninsured depositors, <laughs> there's very prominent disclosures everywhere. Every school child sees the $250,000 FDIC limit in the teller windows. So I think if that's the argument, number one, if they had evidence that there was a risk of a truly systemic, widespread uninsured deposit run, then they should have gone to Congress and gotten approval to provide a blanket guarantee. Even if what they say is true, they don't have the legal tools to do this. They are creating an expectation that uninsured depositors are going to be protected. 
But they don't have the legal tools to provide that blanket guarantee unless they go to Congress. And if they feel that way, they should be going to Congress. There's an expedited process to get approval for that type of temporary unlimited deposit guarantee. So if that was a problem, that's what they should have done. And, you know, just these one-off bailouts. So, okay, who's next? Are they going to get a bailout? You know, what if a community bank goes down? You know, what if a half a billion dollar bank goes down? Their uninsured deposits are going to take losses because they're so tiny. And then what does that do? That makes the problem worse. That makes the uninsured deposits go to the the larger ones. Or if they're going to, they're trying to imply a hundred billion systemic. So we're going to protect that. Then the community banks are going to get, you know, their uninsured deposits are going to leave for those bigger banks. And then and the payers, the community banks will still have to pay into the special assessment that the FTIC has to impose if they take losses on uninsured deposits through a systemic risk exception. So the whole thing just doesn't hang together for me. I don't see the systemic problem. I fear that what has been created now through government overreaction to the failure of this bank, but there are tools. If there's truly a systemic deposit run problem, there are tools. Go to Congress, get the tools and use them. You say maybe they've actually created the problem. What, what do you mean by that? What is the risk? It's because they've drawn attention maybe to... That's sort of a fundamental weakness in the system that would precisely lead to this flight of deposits? Yes, I think implied in their decision was just what you said. They're worried about other regional banks having uninsured deposit runs. That starts feeding on itself. I think there's a lot of commentary about this 2018 law that was passed that streamlined some of the regulations as they applied to mid-tier and smaller banks. Some of that bill I supported, some of it I didn't. I think there are some things that could have been done better in that bill. But I worry that this thing gets politicized and we start creating a narrative. Oh, we had this terrible deregulation of regional banks in 2018. And oh, my gosh, they're all in trouble. That's just simply not the case. Regional banks have been very solid. They've been a very solid and steady part of our banking system. Some of these newer ones, these rapid growth newer ones like Silicon Valley, They may have some issues. Maybe they just don't understand basic interest rate risk management. Apparently, they didn't. But the regional names that we all know, they've been around for a long time. For the most part, they have good assets. They're diversified. They've got sticky deposits. They're just fine. Mm. And it created this narrative that they're all somehow in trouble because there was this deregulation going on. That's simply not true. There are things that should have been done better in that law. I think, one, allowing the mid-sized banks to not deduct against capital market losses on securities they hold as available for sale. They don't have to do that. The big banks do. I think that should be changed. Yeah. Maybe we want to look at all uh, your securities that are hold to maturity. And that's assume some of your listeners understand why this has been a problem with rising interest rates. We can talk about that if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. But it's just an example of a couple of things that maybe need to be changed. But this bank was just mismanaged. That's not why this bank failed. And I think it's true is there has been some criticism, as you know, sort of, and as you say, the sort of political we're seeing the people, some senators and others making the case that this had something to do with that 2018 deregulation. But actually, I think if you look at the numbers, even for Silicon Valley Bank, which, as you say, was probably not the best managed bank in the system, I think it would still have met the basic rate capital and liquidity ratios. Even without the tailoring. That's right. That's right. It would have. Yeah. So I think that's right. Because look, if there's a problem with securities losing bit market value because interest rates are going up, we need to deal with the hold to maturity. Most of them are in hold to maturity, right? Nobody, including the big banks, have to mark them. So if that's an issue, then we need to look more broadly at all banks and how they account for hold to maturity securities. But yes, so you're right. The AFS securities should be marked. That's a mistake. It should be corrected. But even without that, this bank would have failed. Yes. Yeah. I want to come on to those larger questions about the bank's assets and the quality of the bank's assets and what's happened with interest rates and everything in the last year. But while I was quickly staying on Silicon Valley Bank or more broadly, this question of depositor protection, Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, is actually uh, we're recording this Thursday morning. She's testifying around right about now, I think, before the Senate. And I just got a copy of her testimony. And she does say in this testimony, I've got something that's jumped out at me immediately is, it's a brief statement at the top because she's testifying about the budget, but it's a brief statement at the top about the, the measures taken this week. And one of the things she says is this week's actions demonstrate our resolute commitment to ensure that depositors' savings remain safe. Now, that sounds to me like exactly what you're describing, a blanket guarantee of all deposits. I don't know whether she means that, but that's certainly kind of what it sounds like. And it's kind of what the implications are of these measures this week, isn't it? But again, they don't have the legal authority to back that up. <laughs> they don't. Whether well, they're going to make a systemic risk determination for every single bank that fails. They need to go to Congress and get approval, have a sensible program that applies to everybody, charge a fee for it. We did something called the transaction account guarantee during the great financial crisis because we did have a problem with uninsured deposits, especially in business accounts, the larger organizational business accounts that were used for payroll, for operational expenses. Those typically have a lot more than the the deposit limit because, you know, you need a lot of money to pay your bills and things. So a lot of money goes in and out. 
those accounts were leaving the smaller banks, going to the too big to fail ones. So we implemented a transaction account guarantee, charged a fee for it. It was very successful for stabilizing those deposits. Congress, for whatever reason, said going forward that the FDIC needed to get approval for that, but they provided for a streamlined procedure. So I think in retrospect, maybe they should have left that authority with the FDIC, but be that as it may, there is a streamlined procedure to go to Congress. And I think even with the polarization that we're seeing in Congress these days, if the FDIC and Fed and Treasury and the president say they need this authority, I can only assume that Congress would give it to him. I'd give it to him pretty quickly. It's first of all, no, I don't know if we have the systemic problem where she needs to say that. So let me just get that up for I don't like bailouts, period. So I acknowledge sometimes there may be problems, but I don't like bailouts, period. But if she really has evidence that there's a widespread deposit run problem, go to Congress and get the authority, follow the law. Don't create expectations that you have legal tools to do this when you don't. You got to go to Congress, as sure as I can tell. That's how I read the statute. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, talking about the politics and sort of partisanship, I must also ask you, you know, they've been on the other side of the aisle, on the Republican side of the aisle, there have been some Republicans this week raising eyebrows and saying, oh, Silicon Valley Bank, most of its depositors, most of its customers were either tech companies, most of them tech companies backed by venture capital companies, a lot of ties to Democrats. This bank was a very kind of woke bank. Can you imagine, would they have done the same thing for a bank whose customers were mostly fracking companies in tech? Do you think there's anything at all to that? Well, I think when you do these one-off bailouts, you're going to get those kinds of suspicions. No, I don't think, I respect the regulators. I think they made the best decisions. I disagree with the decision they made, but I don't think there was a political motivation or trying to reward a politically correct bank or whatever. I don't think that's true. But I will say, when you do these one-off bailouts, you know, you pick and choose banks. No, okay, we're Silicon Valley Bank, and they do have all these well-heeled venture capitalists, and they were all over Washington. They were calling everybody, lobbying on this. Ironically, after pulling their deposits out (laughs) and forcing the bank to close, they're back in asking for their bailout. You create the perception there's some favoritism. That's why I really don't like it. It hurts people's public confidence in regulators and regulatory decision-making when they pick and choose. We had the same problem during the great financial crisis. Citigroup, by my count, they got four different bailouts. Mm -hmm. You know, Hank Paulson, when they bailed out Bear Stearns and then they let Lehman Brothers go down, there was all the speculation that Hank Goldman didn't like Lehman and, you know, this was like revenge or some kind of thing like that. I don't think any of that is true. But when you do these one-offs, when you single out certain institutions for special treatment, special rules, special bailouts, you get this kind of suspicion, which is another reason why don't do bailouts at all. If you really feel you have to do them, do them for everybody. What would you have done then? So, I mean, if you'd been there, as you were 15 years ago, and you went through yeah, a lot yeah. of decisions back then. So, if you you know, the, the, you see the situation, you saw what was happening last week. What would you have done? You, what would you have just said? Sorry? This- yeah, that's exactly, what, <laughs> that's exactly what I would have said. We handled about 400 bank failures without any kind of systemic risk determination. Yeah. We kept the system stable. Yeah, I would have paid them a 50%, maybe more, because this bank actually had pretty good assets for the FDIC to sell to to make recoveries. I would have followed the usual procedures. I would have done what the FDIC said it was going to do on Friday. Well, they'd put it in a DIMBY. I'm not quite sure. That's kind of a technical difference. I try to sell it, which means putting it in a bridge bank, which is what they eventually did. I pay the insured depositors whatever advance dividend I felt confident I could pay and still have the recoveries out of asset sales to get to reimburse the deposit insurance fund. And I would have communicated this as an unusual situation, a good reminder that banks need to manage their interest rate risk. Managers need to be attuned to this. Examiners need need to be attuned to this. Yeah, I'd use it for a teachable moment. But we handled as if nearly 400 failures when I was there without a systemic risk determination. You can do it. It's just whether you have the will to do it, whether you're going to blink or use the tools you have and stand up and all those well heeled venture capitalists calling you and saying they want to bail out, tell them no. Yeah, that's what I would have done. And it was one of the things the administration was very quick to say is that no taxpayer funds are being applied to this. The cost right, of this will be right. made out of federal deposit insurance, you know, were paid by banks. But we kind of know, don't we? I mean, assuming the recoveries are not enough to fill the gap. Right. Then depositors are being made whole. That's going to be met somehow through federal deposit insurance fees paid by banks, which means ultimately you know, either the shareholders or the customers. I mean, somewhere along the way, this is not a free, free lunch. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. And the small banks are really taking it on the chin because they're going to use individual systemic risk determinations to cover uninsured. Are they going to be doing that for the smaller community banks? The perception will be they won't. But those small community banks are probably going to be hurt by this. They're still going to have to pay into the special assessment they do. 
to recover costs when they make a systemic risk exception. So yeah, I mean, all banks, large and small, have to pay into that. It will be passed on to bank customers. You're right, the special liquidity facility that the Fed set up, that does have a $25 billion taxpayer backstop. But you're right, this idea that, oh, well, banks will pay for it. Well, that includes your bank, that includes your community bank. And that means as a bank customer, you're probably going to be eventually paying for it yourself. I want to talk about that bank term funding program in a second, but just one final thing on this. What are the risks here? I mean, we all talk about moral hazard, and I think this is exactly what you're talking about, what you've just described here, the actions of the administration and the Fed here, the regulators here, is essentially to send a signal to everybody, don't worry, your deposits are safe, however much you've got, wherever it is. What are the implications? I mean, that obviously would seem to be incentivizing risky behavior, right? Moral hazard. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a classic. I mean, and some people have compared it to the Bear Stearns during the great financial crisis. A lot of people think Bear Stearns, the Bear Stearns bailout was you know, kind of the original sin because it set up expectations that these other large security firms were going to get bailed out. And Lehman Brothers, I mean, there's a lot of evidence. Law has been written, you know, that Lehman Brothers had all sorts of opportunities to sell itself and didn't do it because it figured they would have had not gotten a very good price, but they could have sold themselves. But they didn't do it because they figured they were going to get their bailout, too, and then they didn't do it. And then when they didn't get a bailout, the market really overreacted. So I'm not sure. I think we're still seeing deposit outflows. So I'm not sure the market mm-hmm. believes it. And, and they may not believe it because, again, as I said, there's not clear legal authority. They can do this. But if they do believe it, then you do have a moral hazard problem. We do want some market discipline. That's why we have deposit insurance caps. For Main Street households, 250000 is more than enough. And you can get actually a lot more than that by structuring your accounts, joint accounts, trust you know accounts for your kids. And then there are these deposit sweep programs where you can actually, if you have even more, they're like a switch. So they'll break out your deposit in 250000 increments and, and spit it out to other banks. So there are a lot of ways you can get already get a lot more than 250000 But you want some cap because, I'm sorry, you want these companies that, like one crypto company, at a $3.5 billion uninsured deposit, a Silicon Valley bank. That wasn't a small business that needed a payroll. They were just asleep at the switch. They weren't looking at what was going on at the spec. You need that kind of market discipline to complement the supervisory process, which is never going to be perfect. So, but yeah, you're going to create, if they're successful in communicating to uninsured depositors, they're okay then that's going to lead to a laxity and vigilance that this is also not going to be healthy. We're going to take a short break there. But when we come back, I'll have more with Sheila Bear on the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and whether there are wider troubles out there in the U.S. financial system. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with Sheila Bear, former head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. We're talking about this week's turmoil in the U.S. financial system. Let's talk a bit about the asset side of uh, what was going on at SVP and maybe elsewhere. Again, there's been some you know, there's been discussion, and this gets us onto this topic about this issue of assets and hold to maturity and again, mark to market and all of those kind of things going on. It does look as though, and again, we don't know all the details. The Journal has reported a lot on this. Other news organizations have too. But it does look as though SVP, you know, they seem to have had tremendous concentration of assets in bonds, in fixed income, treasury bonds, mortgage-backed securities. And apparently, and again, there have been various reports on this, but they didn't seem to have been particularly well hedged, maybe not, not at all. Right. Isn't there a regulatory problem that didn't somebody miss either the auditors, auditors are signed off yeah. on these accounts, or the regulator in California, wherever somebody's dropped a ball here, haven't they? Well, well yes, they did. <laughs> So, yeah, they loaded up on treasuries and MBS, longer dated treasuries and mortgage backed securities. They went long because they had, this is before the Fed started raising rates, but it wasn't any secret that the Fed was going to need to start raising rates. So they went long to get a little, little more extra interest, a little more yield. And then when interest rates started going up, they didn't hedge the risk. I mean, it would have cost money to hedge the risk, but still, <laughs> you need to hedge your risk with that size of a, a fixed income portfolio. So, yes, that seems to have been the fundamental error. And then, of course, when all these deposit withdrawals occurred, they had to start selling those assets that they had not marked them to market. So they were still being held at book value, even though their market value was significantly less than their book value. And so when they started booking those losses, they didn't have enough capital to withstand it. So that is a problem. And again, I think a lot of this was in the hold to maturity, not the EFS portfolio. So it, I think we need to look more broadly at the accounting treatment for securities that are held by banks, the longer dated ones, especially in these times of rising rates. 
first of all, there, there's a bigger backdrop here. Okay, so we have thirty one trillion dollars of outstanding debt. <laughs> We're bouncing up over yeah. that debt limit already. You know, the government has issued massive amounts of debt. Somebody has to buy it, and banks have bought a lot of it, and they have bought a lot of it. One of the reasons is because regulators basically treat treasuries as risk-free, as a good thing to have for both your capital rule and your liquidity rules. Now, there is something called a leverage ratio as part of the capital regime. It requires capital against all your assets. So there is still, thank goodness, in the U.S., bank lobbyists have been trying to get rid of that, except for trust banks, which is another problem with the 2018 law. I wish somebody would focus on that. The leverage ratio applies to treasury securities, too. And thank goodness, so this problem would be a lot worse. But these banks have been given very, very strong incentives to the regulatory uh, regime to buy this stuff. And that's probably why examiners, too, when they go in and look at the assets, they get in this mindset, oh, these are safe, high-quality assets, without looking at the lost market value. So we talked a little bit about this bank term funding program that the, the Fed also launched which, without getting into too much sort of technical detail, is essentially a lending program for banks that maybe need money. And the, I think the key thing is, right, they can use as collateral these assets that they have. They don't have to mark them to market. This is obviously the SVB's problem is they sold those assets, right. and obviously they sold them at the market price, had to take a huge loss on them. Banks can now go to this special funding facility from the Fed, use the collateral at as essentially the maturity value, and therefore not have to worry about taking air cut. Right, right. Is that, I mean, one thing, well, I've seen one estimate, this could be up to $2 trillion worth of support, essentially, to the banking system from the Fed. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like there is it's easy money for the banks and tighter credit for the rest of us, right? <laughs> so, you know, welcome to the world of an economy that's been overly financialized, it has this financial system is just too big, and that this is just one of the many ugly symptoms of an economy that's driven by monetary policy, which has facilitated a bloated financial sector. So, this is unfortunate. And I'm an inflation hawk. I've been saying since 2010 the Fed should raise rates. Ironically, before I left the FDIC, I remember convening a conference on interest rate risk management (laughs) because I naively thought the Fed would start normalizing, which, of course, they never did. But, yeah, I mean, it's easy money now for the banks, tightening for everybody else. And I've said hit pause because I'm really worried that they're going too fast. You know, you go from 0.08% in Fed funds to about north of 4.5% now. That's a 6,000% increase. That's a humongous, you know, in a year. That's a humongous increase in interest rates. They need to hit pause and assess the impact on the financial system, but more importantly, the impact on the broader economy. There's just only so much the economy and the financial system can absorb. And they need to stop and assess. So I, I hope they do hit pause at their next FOMC meeting. But yeah, there's a larger backdrop here. And yeah, they're loosening. They're, they're going to be printing money to pump into banks. It's a great deal for banks because they can give them their low yielding securities, right? <laughs> at par at maturity value, as you say, and, and get this new money and invest it in some of the higher yielding stuff now. So <laughs> that's a nice trade. One of the issues that you're, you know, very much from 2008, I recall, was you had the Fed's discount window lending. And one of the issues was there was kind of a stigma attached to it, right? You didn't want, and I remember the Fed trying to try and persuade right, everybody right. to go to the discount window. So, you know, the ones right, who right. really needed it wouldn't look so exposed. Now, I think this time around, they're trying to sort of anonymize it, right? I mean, so that, you know, anybody taking advantage yeah. of this of this new funding facility is, we don't know about it. Is that plausible? Well, I don't know. I seem to recall there's some requirements in Dodd-Frank to publicly disclose usage of 13.3 facilities. So I will need to go back and check. I have no doubt they're going to try to do that. If this is a wide scale problem. This is, you know, the unmarked losses on these securities that are in the held to maturity portfolios. If this is really that profound of a problem, then they'll try to stabilize the banks with this facility. Doing that is better than letting the bank fail. And so they'll probably view it again. Another bailout, a more subtle one, another bailout in the name of system stability. So we don't want to out the banks that are having to use this or are using it. My guess is, but if they don't publicly disclose it, everybody's going to be using it. It's a great deal. I do want to move on to the macro. We touched on it a little bit about Fed policy and and the role that that's played in all of this and what the right policy is going forward. Just one very quick final question, though. And again, without sort of putting words in your mouth, it sounds as though you think that the lessons of 2008 and then Dodd-Frank and the reforms that were made then – Basically, I mean, no one would ever be complacent enough to say there won't be another crisis, but they are working and that the major institutions are fine. And they're going to have these occasional blow ups when you get badly managed bank, as we put it with SVB. But that's just the way it is. And this overreacting, it's almost as though you, I think you think they've overreacted. 
here is actually maybe fueling a sense of crisis. But my overall question is, how bad is this? Is this, I don't think anybody thinks it's only on the scale of 2007, 2008, but have we seen the end of these kind of mid-sized bank problems? Or do you think there's more of that or more of other sort of bad stuff to come in the coming weeks and months? Well, I hope, but we won't. I do think that the bigger problem now is just lack of confidence and trust and fear, which is why I think it was a mistake to say this was systemic when I don't think it is. But now everybody's going, oh my gosh, what's going on? They're asking exactly the question you're asking, you know, what's going on? Is there a bigger problem here? And that could feed in itself. So that's my biggest worry. I think prior to this crisis, right, when people asked me that question, I had a bigger concern about the non-bank sector, which is, you know, you have all these private funds that have just grown exponentially with low interest rates, zero interest rates, negative interest rates. And there's not a lot of transparency around, and they do a lot of business with these big banks. They rely heavily on leverage. Their cost of capital are going up significantly. So that's where I would have said, if we're going to have a problem, that's where it would be. If the, we have a problem here, again, my belief is the banks, all banks of all sizes are basically sound. You always have a few outliers. Don't taint the whole system because you got a few outliers that were badly managed. I think the system's going to be okay if everybody keeps their head. But that's really the question. Will people keep their head or just start irrationally withdrawing uninsured deposits? And then you're going to force banks that are otherwise healthy to fail. Moving on again to this macro question, I've had this extraordinarily aggressive monetary policy now for most of the last year, but going between 2008 and 2021, we had this very supportive, most of the time, you know, quantitative easing, zero interest rate policy, pedal to the metal on all of this stuff. How much of a role do you think that has played in the problems that we're seeing now? Has it created a sense of there's just no end to the possibility of this gusher of money and therefore people taking the kind of risks they've been taking? I mean, what's the deeper kind of macroeconomic policy picture here? Yeah, well, it's a good question. But I think, yes, it's creating risk for the financial system. It shouldn't have been a secret to anybody, certainly not anybody who runs a bank or ex examines and supervises and regulates a bank. Yeah, when interest rates go up, financial assets lose value and banks hold a lot of financial assets. There's always been a risk. I mean, rising interest rates help banks too. If, if you're a bread and butter lender, if you take deposits and make loans, this has been a good environment for you because you can finally make some yield on your loan when you couldn't before. Deposit rates almost always lag loan yield. So the deposit costs are going to be going up now, but my guess is there will still be a sufficient spread between lending rates and deposit rates. Traditional banks can make a decent profit. So there are advantages to this and the disadvantages have been known for a long time. And any bank manager should be looking at this every day. Any bank examiner should be looking at this every day. It is a big risk. Can it be managed? Yes. Has it been managed? I think so. It wasn't managed at SVP, but I think most banks are a lot better managed than SVP was. I mean, again, there's the, the old, you know, everybody always says that monetary policy works and sort of until something in the system breaks. But you think, again, you think it's relatively contained and managed to probably just a few institutions. You don't see, I mean, we're obviously seeing a whole different thing going on in Europe, but to be fair, with Credit Suisse, although there are some parallels, broadly speaking, and I'm, you know, again, I'm not asking you to make an expression of complacency here, but you do think that actually the risks have probably been managed pretty well. And despite this, such shocking run up in interest rates that we've seen over the last year, you know, the fallout in the financial system really should be manageable. I think it should be. And certainly with this new Fed facility, I'm not sure how I like it, but I mean, this is going to be, so, it, it, to the extent banks do have a problem with it, they're going to just go borrow a lot of money from the Fed to stay afloat. And that in a way is unfortunate because I think most banks have, I think there may be, well be a few more outliers who have managed their interest rate risk. Of course, now you're penalizing the ones that did by giving this very generous lending facility to the ones that haven't managed it well. But yeah, no, I think uh, the banking system, again, unless fear takes hold, the banking system should be fine. That's not to say there won't be a shoe to drop, but I would still be more worried about the non-bank sector and these highly leveraged funds that their cost of capital have gone up significantly. They do interface with the, with the larger banks a lot. You know, as we saw with Archicos, there's a lot of exposure so if I had to worry about something that would catalyze a financial crisis, I would still be worried more about the non-bank sector than the regulated banking sector. But that said, you know, the Fed we've seen has been raising rates aggressively for the last year after a sort of a little bit of uncertainty in the first part of this year, with all of these data coming in very strong on the economy, particularly strong on the labor market. The consensus was that the Fed was going to have to be right. higher for longer, maybe push up rates again 50 basis points next week and maybe get to a terminal rate of six. Now we have the crisis in the last week and all of those expectations are being revised down. Do you think now the Fed should just pause for now? Would that be where you'd be? I do. Yeah. No. And again, I've been saying since 2010, they should normalize rates. So I hate lax monetary policy. No doubt. And I think inflation is terrible for working people, especially 
housing, energy, food, those are the things that they come out of their monthly budgets. So we need to get inflation under control, but I don't want to do that at the expense of a severe economic recession. And if you've got the economy slowing down, combined with significant distress in the financial system, we're going to have a deep recession. I don't think that's necessary to tame inflation. And I would hit pause. You know, there's a lag. The housing data hasn't really been fully reflected yet in the metrics that we all look at to determine how bad consumer price inflation is. So that's another reason, I think, for the Fed to hit pause. And housing is a huge component of this. It's a huge component of this. Everybody's focused on labor, but actually real wages have been following. Aggregate real wages have been falling for a long time. That has not been a driver of inflation. Housing has been a huge driver. 20% increases in 2020 and 2021, still running hot last year. I think it was about 15. I think it's down to about eight now, but it's still significantly higher than the Fed's target. And so if the Fed needs to keep tightening, I think another thing they should consider is a target approach, sell some of their mortgage-backed securities. That would target credit conditions in the housing market without more broadly impacting all of our credit costs. So I think that's something they want to raise these short-term rates because a lot of pressure on the yield curve. And because, you know, that's been their primary tool you have. Well, recently there's been some ease on the pressure on the yield curve, but if you sell assets, you get the long rates up and that's what you, an inverted yield curve is a strong signal for a recession because that just feeds on itself. If you borrow short and lend long, if your your short-term borrowing costs are higher than the yield you're going to get on your longer-term assets, you have a real problem. And who's going to make more credit available in a condition like that? So that was a lot to unpack in your answer. But yeah, I think they just shit balls on short-term interest rates. Let the housing data come through. If housing hasn't cooled, sell mortgage-backed securities, but leave short-term rates alone for a while. You're saying they should hit pause because the risk is the economy is going to tank. I mean, the Fed always has to weigh up, obviously, inflation, the economy, and financial considerations. Right. You're more right. concerned about the economy tanking and with all of the implications that that has, including for the financial sector, but more generally for households. You're more, more concerned about that than you are, say, if they went with a 50 basis, which they aren't going to do, but the 25 basis point increase next week, that that could have specific more for specific fallout in the financial sector. It sounds like it's more the sort of macroeconomic concern that you have. Well, I'm always more concerned about the real economy than <laughs> financial sector. So I think I always lead with that. And yes, I'm concerned about both, but I'm particularly concerned about the real economy and the labor market. I think they're wrong to target. Well, listen, wages had some catching up to go. And, and again, there's workers are still losing ground. The real wages are going down. So yeah, target housing. Housing is uniquely a Fed phenomenon. I mean, for food and energy, you can point to that and say, okay, well, we had a war in Ukraine. We had supply chain problems with the pandemic. But with housing, housing has been supply constrained since the great financial crisis. You pour two and a half trillion dollars of money to buy mortgage-backed securities. What's going to happen? You're going to turbocharge demand and you're not going to expand access or make homes more affordable. Just the opposite. Your cheap mortgage rates are going to be swallowed by the increases in home prices, which is exactly what happened. So another reason to target housing is that has been primarily caused by monetary policy unlike some of these other inflation components where raising interest rates is going to have arguably limited impact. Sheila Bear, thank you very much indeed. A fascinating and timely conversation, outspoken as ever, as um, (laughs) uh, as you've always been, and very forthright and very clear. And so thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll be back next week with another look at one of the big stories shaping the world. Until then, goodbye. (laughs) 